Every Friday at 3 p.m. I'll give you all the latest political news and analysis and we'll have a robust live debate. To make sure that you're caught up on all of the biggest issues of the day, we'll bring on experts in their field. I'll ask the questions that you'd like to ask. We're not afraid to tackle discussions from all perspectives, including yours. Don't forget The Briefing with me, Arlene Foster, every Friday at 3 p.m. on GB News. Tonight on Farage, we talk about government policy on China. One moment, Rishi Sunak says China's a threat. The next, no, it's just a trade competitor. Where are we on this vital issue? We'll look at counterfeit, illicit goods, how much they're costing the exchequer and the extent to which they're funding terrorism and many other awful things in the world. And joining us on Talking Pints, Dr. Soham Das, a man who goes into prisons and deals with Britain's most dangerous criminals, will ask, is there any hope? Hope of rehabilitation for those who've done such awful, terrible things. But before all of that, let's get the news with Polly Middlehurst. Nigel, thank you. The top story this hour, the Prime Minister has told GB News today dealing with illegal migration is his number one challenge. Rishi Senak also said he wants to reduce legal net migration but refused to say by how much. The UK signed a deal with France last week in an effort to boost cross-channel cooperation. It comes as the National Crime Agency told GB News many Albanian criminals falsely claim they've been trafficked to the UK against their will. Mr Sunak says tackling migrant crossings is now a priority. Right now, our number one challenge is getting a grip of the number of illegal migrants coming, and that's the thing I want to focus on first. I think that's what, by the way, the British public rightly want us to focus on. Our deal with the French this week is the first in a series of things that we'll need to do, but people should rest assured that this is a huge priority for me. Well, the Shadow Chancellor, Rachel Reeve, says the government needs to get a grip on the system. The overcrowding and the conditions that we've seen are, are just inhumane and they must end. But we also need to be processing these cases more quickly. In terms of what's happening at the moment, only 4% of people who came to Britain last year by small boats have had their, um, their, their, their um, applications processed. That is not good enough. The government needs to get a grip of this system so that it is working for asylum seekers and is working for people here in Britain too. Well, the Prime Minister has called on Russia to get out of Ukraine and end what he says is a barbaric war. And speaking in front of Russia's Foreign Minister, Sergei Lavrov, at the G20 summit in Indonesia, Rishi Sunak said the weaponization of energy and food security is totally unacceptable. Meanwhile, 85 missiles have been launched on Ukrainian cities today in what Kyiv is calling the heaviest wave of strikes since the start of a war. In a video address, Volodymyr Zelensky said attacks have disabled the electrical grid in many of his cities and the strikes come just hours after the Ukrainian president said world leaders which, uh, should take notice at a summit via video link at the G20 summit. In a tweet, Britain's foreign minister called the attacks sickening and said they showed Putin's weakness. Well, the breaking news that we're receiving in the last few minutes, firefighters in eastern Poland are saying two people have died in an explosion. It comes after local media reports suggested two missiles had hit Poland. We're yet to confirm those details, but we'll bring you the latest when we have it. You're up to date on TV online and DAB Plus Radio. You're with GB News. Back now to Farage. Good evening. Before we begin, there's a little bit of breaking news in Poland that two people have been killed by what are said to be stray Russian rockets. Now, this is quite a long way away from Lviv. Uh, US intelligence, though, has said they believe that the rockets were Russian. The Polish prime minister is calling an emergency meeting. I don't know quite what to make of that story. I've no doubt we'll find out more as the evening goes on. Before I get to the main topic for debate tonight, 
As you know, we take the show, Farage at Large, out around the country. And we do it normally on a Thursday evening. This Thursday, I'll be in Southampton. I'll have an audience of young entrepreneurs, business people, responding to the autumn statement that Jeremy Hunt is going to give on Thursday. If you want to apply for tickets, don't. You're wasting your time. We're full. But on Friday, we're going to do a look ahead to the World Cup. And sport and politics can never be completely separated, as we've known, through various Olympics going back to the 1930s, through apartheid South Africa, and indeed the fact that Qatar is hosting the World Cup. We'll be debating all of those human rights issues. We'll be debating the original decision by FIFA to go to Qatar and what on earth could have motivated them. And I'm very pleased to say that we're going to be joined by the 1966 hat-trick scoring World Cup hero, Sir Jeff Hurst, which is terrific. If you are a football fan, a sports fan, you want to get involved in this debate about sport and politics and how they collide, if you want to meet Sir Jeff Hurst, for goodness sake, then please go to gbnews.uk and come and join us on Friday evening, live at 7 o'clock. Now, in the leadership election for the Conservative Party, this is the one, of course, that Sunak lost to Liz Trust. they were trying to bid against each other in the TV debates for who was the hardest, who took the toughest line on China. This is what Rishi Sunak had to say at the time. What we do need to do is acknowledge that China is a threat to our national security, it's a threat to our economic security. And that's why, as Chancellor, I was pleased that we could put forward something called the National Security and Investment Bill. And that gives us the powers as a country to protect ourselves against countries like China who are trying to infiltrate our companies and steal our technology. That's what we need to do. But we also need to stand up for our values. So there you are, Mr. Tough Man. Absolutely. But today, interviewed by GB News' Darren McCaffrey, he struck a rather different tone. Now, China represents a systemic challenge to our values and interests. It also represents the biggest state-based threat to our economic security. That's why it's right that we take the steps that are necessary to protect ourselves against that. Our approach is aligned with our closest allies, like America, like Canada, like Australia. I'm here at this summit talking to those leaders about our approach to China, and I'm confident that the way we are dealing with it is very much in accordance with how they are too. So they've gone from being a threat to being a competitor. Interestingly, within the last 24 hours, Joe Biden's taken a much softer line with China, as indeed has Prime Minister Albanese in Australia. They do tend to act together this lot. That may be a good thing or a bad thing, depending on your point of view. But it raises questions in my mind. Is Rishi Sunak a weak leader? If you can change positions as quickly as that, what does it actually mean? What does he really believe in? What is the government's actual long term plan and strategy? Is there one? You tell me, please, is Rishi now proving to be a weak leader without vision and without strategy? Let me know your thoughts, Farage, at gbnews.uk. We're joining me as someone who knows a bit about China. Charles Parton, former diplomat who's worked in and around issues with China, Hong Kong, Taiwan for best part of a quarter of a century, I think it's fair to say, and now associate fellow at the think tank, Rusi. Charles, it's very com you know, difficult for the British public. We have a Prime Minister one week talking about China as a threat. We have a Prime Minister now who thought it was a threat and thought that it wasn't. Do we actually have any policy, plan or strategy as to how to deal with China? Well, that's a good question. I mean, let's just start with, with, with the, whether, whether it's a threat or not. I mean, I yeah. don't think it's necessarily a good th idea for, for Prime Ministers to bandy labels around that or even perspective. Prime Ministers. Well, both did. Uh, and both did. Um, but, but, I mean, everybody knows that China's a threat. It's not necessary for the Prime yeah. Minister to say so. But, you know, the head of MI6, the head of MI5 and, and various others have said so uh, quite loudly. Um, so that's the way uh, it is. And we shouldn't be too loud in, in, in our um, saying of that, unless it's a matter where um, it really is beyond the pale. I mean, like in Xinjiang and, and, and the it really is. I mean, it's been labelled genocide, but it's certainly crimes against humanity. Then I think it's right for prime ministers to make a noise yeah. about it. Yeah. 
But when you what talk, about, what about but one moment? Sorry mm. to interrupt you. What about Hong Kong? Well, and Hong Kong too. I mean, we did I mean, a deal, and they've broken the deal. Yeah, I mean, these are important issues. When you go against international law, you break international law. You're undermining the whole system in which nations get on together. So that's a very serious matter, and it should be called out. But I think that's the point. It's it's individual policies and and actions that should be called out loudly. But just labelling people a threat. I mean, we all know that, but it's, it, it just, it just okay. annoys. But, of course, you, you <coughs> rightly ask, well, OK, but then do we have a strategy? Um, now, if you go across into Whitehall and ask people, they'll say, yes, we, we've got a, a strategy. And you say, well, what is it exactly? Uh, and it's, I have to say, not particularly clear. And if you go back even over three years, the Foreign Affairs Committee of the House of Commons called for a government strategy. And I think it's, it is really important because... Um, if they've got one and, and nobody knows that they've got one, what use is that? And if it's, if it's confidential and classified, well, most of government won't be allowed to read it because most of government isn't vetted. And, of course, all of government has to know how to deal with China in the same way. Um, and so does business need to know what the attitude, and so does academia, and so does civil society. So I think it's absolutely right to call loudly for a, for a strategy. Yes, they've been a little bit um, preoccupied with other matters over, over the last few years, what with COVID and, 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 and problems with inside the but Conservative is, is, Party. Is that but, really an excuse? Uh, I don't think it's uh, a sufficient excuse. I mean, I think we really do need a clear guidance on where we are with, with China. And I don't think that, um, from what I know, the government has really been putting enough time and energy into that. So... Uh, one hopes that it... it yeah, come, and Sunak himself, soon. Sunak himself, clearly all over the place on this issue. Well, I mean, it's not an easy issue because you have things like national security which and, and data privacy and, you know, our values, uh, all of which are under threat. But at the same time, there's a great interdependence with China, uh, you know, in trade and investment in global goods like climate change and and even in things like epidemics, uh, pandemics, which, <laughs> where perhaps the, the, yeah. the, the um, uh, cooperation has not been ideal. No. Um, so it's not something that you could, as you did in the old days of the Cold War, just turn your black on it and say, well, Russia, we're not doing anything with you. Um, you have to deal with China. So getting that balance right so is you, not easy. So the use of the word threat would put China on the same level as Russia as government cu currently sees it? Well, uh, actually, I think a really good expression that uh, I think it was the head of one of the German intelligence services came out with the other week, which was um, Russia is the storm and China is climate change. Um, and I think that, in a way, sums it up. The immediate problem, of course, is, is Russia and what's going on in Ukraine. But in the longer term, yes, I mean, I think the greater mm. threat to our, mm. our way of life and the greater need to protect ourselves against it is, is with relation to China. Now, we've seen what happened in Hong Kong, but as I mentioned earlier, the deal broken and we've done almost nothing. It was quite interesting, actually. In the early days of the protests in 2019, they carried Union Jacks, but by the end of the protest, they carried American flags because they felt there was more verbal support coming from Washington than there was from London. Um, is that, I, mean, I'm, it, I mean, always you, I ask people who say, well, the British government didn't do much. I say, well, what precisely could have they have done? I mean, they did, for instance, um, we, have, have, we have this scheme for allowing Hong Kong people to come to the UK. A very generous one. Very. Um, and, and in many ways, uh, unexpected, I think. So, uh, and I think we were quite loud as a government uh, about this. But there's not a great deal you can do. Well, once you've made the mistake, it's a little bit difficult to backtrack. Well, uh, whether or not, it, you know, the 1997 is a mistake or not, or whether it was inevitable... Well, it looks is, like is it now, but, 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 but uh, let, yeah. let's move on, Charles, to Taiwan. Mm. You, know, you know, clearly, clearly what... I think what Putin saw was Western weakness post the withdrawal from Afghanistan. I don't, I don't believe that the Ukraine invasion would have happened without Afghanistan and the fall of Kabul. I would have thought President Xi thinks the West is still pretty inept and pretty weak. And again, with government policy over Taiwan, there is great confusion, I'm sure, amongst our viewers and listeners, because on the one hand, Liz Truss says, look, we will supply weapons to Taiwan if, if that's what it comes to. And now Rishi Sunak won't answer the question. Where do we stand on Taiwan? And indeed, where do you think we should stand on Taiwan? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think Liz Truss's "We will sell weapons to Taiwan" it, it comes again into that category of just making a noise for noise' sake, which is actually particularly useful. I mean, if you want to sell weapons to Taiwan, that's fine, but make sure that 
they've said, the Taiwanese have said to you, these are the weapons you want. Have we got them? And they're not all in Ukraine mm. or, or mm. wherever else. Mm. Um, and does it fit with the sort of defence strategy that Taiwan should be adopting? Um, on that basis, go ahead and sell them. And, and if the Chinese make a fuss about it, too bad. Um, but I think that we're slightly mesmerised by the whole military threat. And, and I, I don't dismiss it. And certainly we should take, um, you know, uh, protective measures against that. But I think much more important, actually, is the economic um, deterrence that we can bring to China. Um, I, I mean, if <coughs> the Chinese are convinced, as they should be, that we will introduce sanctions against them, which will be rather like the nuclear deterrent. I mean, it is mutually assured destruction. Mm. It, it, it would... It, it, because it, we, we've become very dependent upon them, haven't we? Well, and they are to some extent on us too. So, yeah. so um, this is mutually assured destruction, and it worked in the nuclear case because both sides believe that in the event of it yeah. escalating yeah. to that level, we should make sure that the Chinese are convinced that it will escalate to that level economically, which will destroy our economies and theirs. And in the chase case of the Chinese, without a social security net, with massive unemployment that would result, um, there will be riots. I mean, there have already been riots about COVID yeah. today. So that would be a anyway, threat. That would be a um, threat that, that really would have an impact. I, I think, yes, and I think we should... Um, Interesting. Uh, you know, people like the Americans, of course, <laughs> I think certainly will Im impose sanctions. I think we probably will too. It remains to be seen how far Europe would go. Even Switzerland, for goodness sake, said that they would um, implement the same threat, um, sanctions that the EU. Yeah. Now, that doesn't necessarily say what they are, but, but for Switzerland to say that far is... is a certain... Interesting, interesting. So I think that, that is, um, you know, something we, we need to, again, quietly make clear to the Chinese that this will happen. Um, and, you know, they've looked at the Western resolve vis-a-vis -vis Russia. Mm -hmm. This is a whole new level, of course, because of mm. the independence between us and, and, and okay. China. But they are dependent on but us But a diplomatic too. threat, they have to believe that we would actually do it. Yes, they, they do. And, and we would need to be sure amongst ourselves, and they would mm. need to be sure in Whitehall that, that okay. this is actually the right policy. Which goes back to your original question, is do we have a strategy? <laughs> um, and, and do we have that sort of policy on Taiwan? Yeah. Charles Parton, spoken like a true diplomat. I'm going to go a bit further. It's a shambles. They haven't got a clue what they're doing. There is no strategy whatsoever. In a moment, and I, this is linked to China, I'm going to be talking in a moment about counterfeit goods, the sheer value of them in the British and global economy, the amount they cost the exchequer, the extent to which they fund terrorism and other bad activities, and the fact that most of them are manufactured in China. All of that in just a moment. Every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> whether you're with us on TV, radio, or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6 a.m. Hope you can join us. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm, where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee, but we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11pm. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11pm, seven nights a week. 
Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB Plus Digital Radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Join me, Arlene Foster, for the briefing on GB News. Every Friday at 3 p.m., I'll give you all the latest political news and analysis, and we'll have a robust live debate. To make sure that you're caught up on all of the biggest issues of the day, we'll bring on experts in their field. I'll ask the questions that you'd like to ask. We're not afraid to tackle discussions from all perspectives, including yours. Don't forget the briefing with me, Arlene Foster, every Friday at 3 p.m. on GB News. Hello, I'm Alastair Stewart, and I'd invite you to join me at noon on Saturdays and Sundays for Alastair Stewart and Friends. I've been in this business for over 40 years. Now, here at GB News, I've never been happier. I get to choose the big stories that really interest me. We hear what you have to say, and you hear what I have to say. I really hope you can join me noon on Saturdays and Sundays. Your thoughts on Rishi Sunak? Is he a weak leader? Is he all over the shop? Well, Nikki says no, he's not weak, just following orders. Ah, well, this is the idea that all the globalists act together. Mm. Well, it's interesting though, isn't it? You know, one US president and two prime ministers, all within a space of 24 hours changing policy. But I guess that's what G20 does to people. Kathy says, yes, just as we thought. <laughs> How is it that he seems to have a free pass as an unelected leader, but Liz Truss was immediately done for by the monetary markets? It's beyond me, to be honest with you. To answer that question, Kathy, we'd need several hours. Michael says, Rishi Sunak isn't a leader. He's a follower of his financial backers who helped put him where he is. You're not suggesting the fact that Rishi Sunak used to work at Goldman Sachs is something to do with this, are you? Surely not. Another says, not my prime minister. No, and that actually is part of Rishi's problem, the whole legitimacy element of the fact that he's not been put before the public and that the Tory party keeps changing leader and therefore... Our Prime Minister. Now, today, I bet you didn't know it, well, in fact, tomorrow, to be truthful, it is going to be the first ever World Anti-Illicit Trade Awareness Day. I know, I get it, it's a bit of a mouthful. Well, let me tell you something. The more I've looked at this, the deeper I've understood this, the more I understand there is a real issue here. Bear with us, because we're going to explain it to you. Well, I'm not going to explain it to you, but Michael Mazinski, who's CEO of London Advertising, is. This is all about counterfeit goods, fake goods. Just give us some idea, quick idea of the scale of this. Well, when we were first briefed about it, we were told that the total cost to the global economy is $4.2 trillion, which is, you know, a number that is just too difficult, too yeah. difficult to even comprehend. If you, if you put it in these terms, it's bigger than the GDP combined of 145 nation states. It's colossal. And this is uh, fake Nike trainers, it's Louis Vuitton handbags, and it's fags, isn't it? Yes. It's I mean, tobacco's huge, isn't it? It's a, a major problem. Um, and also partly because it's been taxed so much, it's therefore far more economical to buy the, the illegal yeah. versions of it. But the scale affects pretty much every industry. Luxury goods, $1.6 trillion worth of value. Um, I looked up the numbers. China exports something like $2.5 trillion worth of goods, yet 80% of the total illicit trade mm -hmm. comes from China. Mm -hmm. So that would be about $3.3 trillion. So the value of their illicit trade is bigger than their legitimate trade. And in this country, things are being sold illicitly. They're being sold for cash. None of that is being declared. The exchequer is losing out in a big way. That's right. So the figure there of 95 uh, billion cost to the UK economy is four times the amount of that Jeremy Hunt is trying to find on Thursday through us paying tax. Which or another way around is 
half of all income tax paid in this country represents what the value of the illicit trade is here. I mean, it's mind-boggling. I realised, of course, we had a very, very big black economy, but I had no idea it was as big as this. And the other thing that I've learned, Michael, talking to you over the last 48 hours about this, is the money that gets raised through these means is used for some really, really bad things. And the one thing that really struck me extraordinarily was what happened ahead of the Charlie Hebdo attacks in Paris. Explain. Yes. So ISIS set a, uh, sent a cell uh, into Belgium to prepare for the attack in Paris. And we have a letter where they actually gave instructions to the terrorist cell to go and sell illicit cigarettes on the streets of Belgium to raise the cash flow to finance their terrorist attack. And we know the outcome of that was horrendous. horrendous. Uh, it's also t the, the same gangs who are involved in the selling of whether it's a cheap bag down the market with a cheeky chappy out of the back of his car, uh, actually, they're making a mint. They, they live in beautiful houses, they have lo lots of luxury cars, and they're the ones milking it against the, the people who are law-abiding, paying taxes, are the ones suffering because of that suction out of the economy. And to make this comprehensible, this huge figure, um, one of our creative chappies, a very talented chap called Gary, came up with the idea of lumping it all together under the theme of the illegal empire. And that's what we're launching tomorrow as a global yes. campaign. Yes, and it'll, not be, just UK. And, and it'll be, but it'll be in British newspapers tomorrow. That's right. We've, and got, we've got the exclusive first lead on this. You I have, think. Yeah. Uh, because we wanted somebody who's got the campaigning skills to raise the, the, the story, not just here in the UK, but internationally. And we've been working with Crime Stoppers International yes. as our client to, to bring this story out and, and getting this exposure here today and what we'll see in, in the press tomorrow. We've got posters going out telling people about this is because what we want is to put pressure on governments to do, seen, something. to do something. We've seen that pressure on governments, they're actually now getting around to the channel crossing issue. But if we could have the same pressure well, applied, maybe. well, <laughs> the issue about being able to do something yeah. is a different matter. But yeah. the, the, there is political jeopardy. At the moment, there is no political jeopardy and there is no pressure well. on governments to, to <clears throat> resolve this. Well, Michael, I have to say thank you for approaching me with this story. Thank you for giving us the first shot at it in British media. I'm absolutely stunned, folks, by the numbers. Now, Shane Britton is going to talk to us from Florida. He is the chief executive officer of Crime Stoppers International that Michael just mentioned. Shane, good afternoon, your time, I guess. Um, the numbers here are absolutely mind-boggling. Uh, the, the fact that the proceeds of this go to fund things like the Charlie Hebdo attacks is truly shocking. But can I ask you, you know, this is a global problem, clearly it's a problem in America and elsewhere, but in practical terms, Shane, what can governments actually do to try and fight this? Thanks very much for having me, Nigel. You know, I think one of the main things that we need to be focused on here is awareness that, as you said, this number is staggering. This is the, if it was an economy, this would be the fourth largest economy in the world. And people just don't know it. And, and I don't think that just goes to consumers knowing about this, but individuals in government don't know about it. And it's up to organizations like Crime Stoppers International to really raise that awareness to say, these are funds that are going into organised crime syndicates. They're going to terrorist organisations. And it's time we did something about that. Is it a matter to some extent? I mean, are we back to borders again? Do we need to do more random spot checks on, for example, goods coming from China? Might that not be, you know, under pain, uh, you know, of, of some form of sanction? Might that not be an issue here? I certainly think that there's a role at, at border inspection points. There's There's got to be a more, more of a vigilant approach on what we can actually do at the borders. Uh, some of that comes down to increasing the penalty for some of these things as well, to making sure that the penalty for the crime yeah. is is really linked to the severity of, of the impact that the crime has on all elements of society, uh, as, as well as making sure that enforcement is consistent. That, that we're encouraging law enforcement agencies to go and pursue this, uh, the criminals behind this, and hold them accountable for what they're doing, not just see it as a victimless crime, because it's not. Mm. Mm. And, of course, you know, if people are buying knocked-off goods and they know they're buying knocked-off goods, they need to understand they have a responsibility too. But also, I, I mean, where does big tech come in all of this? 
you know, I mean, it's big tech. We've seen, for example, and showed examples on this show of TikTok being used by criminal gangs to traffic people, uh, to get money out of people, to cross the English Channel. Presumably, big tech is a means by which many of these goods are sold. Yeah, absolutely. And and certainly tech platforms themselves are being ripped off by some of these criminal syndicates. We're seeing fake mm. electronics mm. and other devices. But but these these products are for sale on social media platforms. And, and that's something that has to stop. It has to stop being accepted that this is just a, a victimless crime. It's something that is, is accepted by everyone as not really being a big deal. $4.2 trillion. That, that's a lot of zeros. Uh, and, hey, and we need to see that. This is money going to extremist groups, going to organised crime groups. That's uh, that's a concern to all of us. Shane, Crime Stoppers International, Michael, thank you, both of you, very much indeed. You've woken me up in the last 48 hours. And isn't it interesting that this issue brings together control of borders, our relationship with China and what big tech is doing to us? Oh, and they're not paying much tax either to the exchequer. So this issue brings all those things and terrorism together. It's a real issue. And guys, I wish you both well with your campaign. In a moment, I'll talk about Tony Blair. Did you know he was advising the Albanian government? Yeah, he really is. All of that in just a moment. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. We are GB News, and we'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for bringing us your conversations, for helping our great nation find its voice. We are here for you on radio, television, and online across England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. It's not the BBC, you know, you actually get your facts right. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Monday to Thursday on GB News, it's Bev Turner today from 10 a.m. There's never been a more interesting but also critical time in British politics. And I can't wait to bring you the biggest stories of the day with the best factual accuracy and also a few of my own opinions thrown in. We'll engage in passionate but always polite debate with your thoughts and opinions at the centre of it all. Monday to Thursday, 10 till 12 on TV, on radio and online. Every Friday and Sunday night from nine, it's Mark Dolan tonight. We're on the same page again. Great, There's something great, great happening. Let him finish. Don't be such a cranky. <laughs> that mini budget was the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> and on Saturday, my show just got bigger. From eight, it's Mark Dolan's Saturday Night In. You can't govern a country if you can't speak. <laughs> Stop talking. My God, we reached the end. I've never been early in my life. <laughs> <laughs> Only on GB News, the People's Channel. We are GB News, right across the nation. You can get us on television, on radio, on digital. We're absolutely everywhere. Amazing! You see, amazing! You remind me of me and the European Parliament. <laughs> but here's the most important bit. We are not part of the mainstream establishment. We think and speak just like you do. We are the people's channel. Magnificent. That's really, really thoughtful. Come and join us on GB News, the people's news channel.
Well, here's a real what the Farage moment. Now, Albania, much in the news. The Albanian Prime Minister, Eddie Rama, he's been in the news, deeply critical of things that have been said by Suella Braverman. And perhaps, to some extent, you know, he was behind what happened, the awful scenes that we saw on Remembrance Weekend happening on Westminster Bridge through Parliament Square, the defacing of Churchill's statue with the Albanian flag. But Eddie Rama, I didn't realise this, I am a little bit shocked by this, but he says, without Tony Blair and Alistair Campbell, I would probably never have been in politics. They were my inspiration. It was like meeting the idols. We're good friends. Any time I want advice, I ask Tony. Now, it's fair to say that Blair is not paid by the Albanian government, but he is still currently an advisor for them. Alistair Campbell's relationship with the Albanian government is deeper. So I ask tonight openly both Tony Blair and Alistair Campbell, given what's happening across the English Channel. Have you even attempted to use your influence with the Albanian government to improve the situation? Or are you so committed to open borders and EU membership and Schengen that you simply can't bring yourself to? A little bit of a follow-up from yesterday. We reported on that boat that landed on the beach of St Margaret's in Kent and the fact that seven or eight men just simply disappeared. Well, perhaps a little bit of, well, not good news, but slightly better news is that two men suspected of facilitating the beach landing of that small boat have been arrested and charged with conspiracy to facilitate illegal entry. And two more Albanian men have been picked up and arrested today. Perhaps they were part of the seven or eight or got away. Um, but I have to say, there is a lot more to do with this. I, I, you know, we see British NGOs, we see them over in Calais, over in Dunkirk, handing out leaflets to people, telling them what phone numbers to ring and what to do. They say it's all in the name of being humanitarian. But I am absolutely convinced that on many occasions there are people up on the cliffs in Kent and elsewhere who are directly in touch with people on those boats, and they too effectively are aiding and abetting this trade. If any of them were ever questioned, they say they're carrying out humanitarian work and, and, and helping refugees, but it's pretty obvious that most of these people are not. Now, something that I found pretty disturbing over the course of the last couple of days, and it says a lot about what is going wrong in our society and in our country. There were, over the course of the weekend, a spate of vandalistic, unpleasant attacks on war memorials. The first one I'm going to highlight is in Nuneaton. Lewis Carter of Nuneaton, killed in action just a few years ago. He has a plaque dedicated to him, which those watching on the screen can see, was vandalised, much to the horror and upset of his mother, Denise. In Flintshire, a war memorial there in North Wales, sprayed, of all things, with a swastika. In Edinburgh, in Edinburgh, in the centre of the city of Edinburgh, a war memorial following a wreath-laying service was set fire to. Not just the wreaths, burnt, but as you, you know, those watching television again can see, damage to the memorial itself. In Londonderry, in Londonderry, part of a centenary memorial wall has simply been stolen and been removed. In Exeter, in Devon, well, there, there, uh, quite extraordinary, a silent statue that was put there to commemorate the centenary of the end of the Great War literally snapped in half. And finally, or at least I say finally, this is the last one that I know of, in Ilkley, uh, a memorial there has been hit and vandalised twice in the space of a week. And it's said that the motivation here was a racial motivation. I'm not quite sure what that actually means, uh, but I find the whole thing disturbing. What is happening to our country? 
when you see things like that, you begin to think maybe it's going to the dogs. It is very, very depressing. And I'm sorry, I don't always want to bring you bad news, but that I find to be bad news. In a moment, a man who deals with bad news every single day, Dr. Soam Das, has, for some years now, dealt with the literally most dangerous murderers and criminals in this country. I'm going to be fascinated in a moment on Talking Pints to chat with him about what motivates those people and is there any chance of them being rehabilitated. All of that in just a few minutes. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. We are GB News. And we'd like to say thank you. To each and every one of you. For helping our great nation. Find its voice. We're absolutely everywhere. Across England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. On TV. On radio. And online. We're proud to be the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. On the Mark Stein Show, we cover the stories a lot of people are scared even to mention. The stuff that really matters with some of the world's biggest thinkers. Now is his opportunity to kind of take the steering wheel of history. Break away from the flock at 8 o'clock on GB News with the Mark Stein Show. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deems & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Mark Stein. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubri, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7 on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubri, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7 on Jubes and Kerr. I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB plus digital radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. It's time for Talking Pints. I'm joined by Dr. Shaham Das, and he joins me here on the show. And he's got a job I can't imagine doing. Now, as a consultant forensic psychiatrist, and you're the first psychiatrist we've had on the show, I've been much too frightened to invite any before. But your job, going into prisons, you know, this is the high security end, and you're dealing with murderers, you're dealing with just, I mean, some of the most dangerous criminals in this country. And I... Yep understand, looking at your background, that you didn't get off to a very auspicious start on day one. Yeah, so I wouldn't want to contribute to the stigma that people that have mental illnesses are dangerous because categorically the vast majority of them are not. But I didn't help uh, that preconception by being punched on my very first day on a medium secure unit. Yeah, uh, <laughs> this, this gentleman had a mental illness. He had a delusion about me. He thought I was an old school bully in disguise. So because of his delusional beliefs, he preemptively struck me on the side of the head. Yeah. When you're dealing with these people, and they've committed horrible crimes, you know, the worst crimes in the country, 
do they all have mental illness or are some of them actually quite rational human beings who just decide to do something nasty? So that is a complicated question. If I was to simplify, I would say that there's two ends of the spectrum, right? So on one end, you've got people with pure mental illness, typically something like schizophrenia or bipolar. And if their symptoms are so severe that they're not in control of their actions, so if they are having auditory hallucinations, hearing voices, then I think it's fair to say that they're not criminally culpable. On the other end of the spectrum, you have people with personality disorders. So that's different from a mental illness because it's far more ingrained. So the personality disorder I see the most is antisocial personality disorder. People who lack empathy, who don't mm. care about the rights and wrongs of other people. So and, those and, people. And are they criminally insane? So I would say the ones on the first end of the spectrum that have severe mental illnesses that are not in control of their actions, I wouldn't use that term, but yeah, they're, they're mentally disordered offenders. Yeah. The ones on the other end of the spectrum who do know what they're doing, mm. they're uh, a lot more difficult to rehabilitate and they're far more in control of their actions. Yeah. Those with severe mental illness, and this, 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 this fascinates me, I mean, up to 40 years ago, 50 years ago, people with extreme mental health conditions, we put in institutions, and they were left there for the whole of their lives. And it was a pretty unpleasant, pretty brutal, thing to do, but the rationale behind it was that it protected the rest of society. Now, with care in the community, as it's been called, it's had various names over the decades, yeah. we don't believe in doing that. And yet I saw a figure a couple of years back that over 100 people a year are murdered by people who've been let out of prisons or institutions who clearly still have mental illnesses. Impossible question to ask you. But an important question, how do we draw the line on this? How, how do we deal with this? Is this current policy better than the old one? Well, I think it definitely is better than the old one because it gives people a chance at rehabilitation and redemption. And treatments have moved on, medication has, has moved on. The ability to, to make people less dangerous is far more uh, available now than it ever was before. I suppose the problem is, is that as a forensic psychiatrist, when you're treating somebody in prison or in a secure unit, you have to eventually make a dis uh, decision to discharge people, right? You can't keep them in indefinitely, it's not humane, and it clogs up the system for other people that need treatment. The question is, how do you know they're safe? And all you can do is go with the evidence in front of you. So you give lots of different therapies, you look at their behaviour on the mm. wards, whether they're pushing boundaries, <clears throat> you test them on leave. So some, you have to make that decision. And sometimes the person in front of you seems stable at this point, and then after discharge, there's so many destabilizers in the community, access to victims, access to alcohol and drugs. So you can't always predict what's going to happen. That must make you feel awful sometimes. Well, I, I suppose I try and focus on the positive. So I think of the far larger proportion of people who we do make stable, who came in very dangerous, completely psychotic, yep. suffering from these symptoms, who don't go on to commit violence. Uh, and also, I, I believe in the system. I trust in the system, even though we're not going to get it right every single time. <clears throat> we managed to improve the futures of many, many people. Rehabilitation. I mean, let's take the case of, you know, somebody who has sexually assaulted and murdered somebody. Can someone like that ever be rehabilitated? I think so, yeah. From my clinical experience, it's possible. It depends on so many factors. If it was, as I was talking about before, directly related to symptoms of mental illness, mm -hmm. and if you can treat and remove those symptoms with the right medication, the right rehabilitation, then that person is safer at the point of release. If it's something to do with their cognitive distortion, so if they have these really maladaptive beliefs, such as, for example, that you know women are pieces of meat or that they yeah. have, uh, they're entitled to sex, that's much, much harder to treat. It is possible, but you need to have a level of insight and cooperation from the patient themselves. How do we compare with other countries? Do we have more people in these secure units? Do we have a higher crime rate? Are we pretty much the same for other European-style countries? I think um, the UK is especially adapt at rehabilitating mentally disordered offenders. Mm. Some other countries have systems, but so America is a very good example of this. They tend to concentrate too much, I think. They focus on just detaining people. So there's very little resources, time or effort to try and rehabilitate them. So you get this massive incarceration of the general population. You have all these people backed up in prison with no chance of becoming yeah, less dangerous. It is extraordinary, isn't it, that America is 5% of the world's population but 20% of the world's prison population. Um, but that's what the Americans have voted for. Um, and I guess in a democracy, that's what you have to have. But your point about rehabilitation, you know, I, mean, I suppose the general public are quite sceptical on this point. How do, you, how do we convince them? 
Well, I think they're skeptical because you hear the horror stories, as you, you mentioned before. You hear the bad stuff. The bad stuff, when people, uh, patients are released and go on to, to commit serious violence and even kill. That does happen, I'm not denying that it happens. But you don't hear about, you know, the um, hundreds of more patients that are successfully rehabilitated. But to answer your question, Nigel, I think it's all about trying to open the doors and tell people what actually goes on in these units. Mm. I think forensic psychiatry is a very closed world. There seems to be a, a, well, a layer of secrecy. I'm learning now about it because I you know, already discussed it. And you've written about all of this in your book, In Two Minds. If we look back at the 20th century, two of the biggest, and actually of themselves, most damaging political philosophies, one was based on nature. One was the National Socialist idea that who you are, how you behave, Everything was about your biology, your race, your genes, your makeup. That determined absolutely what you would be and who you would be. And then we had the other ideology of communism, which is that's got nothing to do with it. It's all about nurture and it's all about environment. As I say, both of them in their own way led to some pretty appalling stuff happening in the 20th century. But particularly when you deal with these people who, who, who've done these terrible things, for whatever reason, which of those two factors do you think is the strongest? I think any psychiatrist would have to answer that it's a combination of two. It's nature and nurture. <laughs> Having said that, I think that the nurture is the part that me as a forensic psychiatrist can deal with. That's the part we can assess. Those are the risk factors that we can potentially change. You can't really change nature. So even though they're both as equally as important as each other, the, the focus of rehabilitation has to be nurture rather than nature. The Home Office has been criticised on the cross-channel crossings, criticised in so many areas. Not fit for purpose was a phrase used about it many, many years ago. You know, you, you are dealing in the end ultimately with the Home Office. How are our prisons being run? How are they being staffed? What condition are they in? So I don't think it's, it's, a, it's any secret, Nigel, that the prisons are at breaking point. And it's all to do with funding. Everything's to do with money and funding. So, well, is it to do with funding or, or, or how the money is spent? Uh, well, I think, I think the two of them are connected. The number of prison officers per capita or per prison population is decreasing almost on an annual basis. I think it's very variable between different prisons and how they're managed and yeah. how well they're run. But you have some prisons where the inmates seem to be taking over control. And you can barely have enough staff to, to actually do the day-to-day -day care, let alone the psychiatric rehabilitation that they need. So I think that's one of the biggest problems in prisons, yeah. It's no wonder, really, that in your spare time you write fiction and short stories. Is that, is that your big escape from this? I mean, are you able to leave this job and leave it behind you, or do you bring those problems home with you? I definitely think that I've got uh, an innate ability to kind of detach myself, compartmentalise yeah. what I see in the horrific crimes that I see on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, I think there's a number of reasons. I think it's my natural personality. I think I'm so busy with other things, media, ventures, YouTube channels, writing books. But also the throughput of my cases is, is massive. So by the time I've finished one report, I already have two or three others lined up. So there's no time, time to think. No time to perseverate over the horrible things I see. But have the odd drink now and then. Of course. Shyam Das, thank you very much indeed. Not just for joining me on the show, but for what you do. That Thanks is terrific. Very much. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers. Right, we've got a couple of minutes left and we're going to do Barrage the Farage. I have no idea what you have sent in to me. Mickey asks me Is the latest Tory plan to stop? The boat's going to work. Mickey, you're having a laugh, mate, aren't you? Do you think giving another £63 million this year to the French, having given them £55 million the year before, £54 million the year before that, £3 million the year before that, and £45 million the year before that, do you get the trend here? The more money we spend, the more that come. It is hopeless. Even if you stop the boats, even if you put a knife into those dinghies, and I've shown these videos before on this show, the very same people who were stopped that day come back the next day. It doesn't make a blind bit of difference. One viewer asks me, do you think King Charles will break protocol and meddle in politics? Well, I tell you what, he'd be an absolute blooming fool if he did. The British public would go bonkers. Support in the monarchy would disappear very, very quickly. I'll tell you what, he's actually taken over. And I think, I personally believe that that King's speech, 
he gave to the nation, you know, within 24 hours of the death of his mother. And he clearly is, you know, whatever we think of some of his views, he clearly is a very sincere, very genuine, very emotional person. I believe that speech won over the country and indeed much of the world to his side. And I, I have to tell you, I've clashed with him in the past. Personally, I've shown you some of the clips in the past on this show. I think he's made a very, very good start as king. He's not a complete fool. I don't think he will meddle in politics. At least I hope and pray not for the future of the monarchy. Because what we learnt with the death of our beloved queen, actually, is that a constitutional monarchy is a far better model of doing things than anything anybody else in the world has come up with. I've got time for one more. Do you think any Conservative um, will... with a majority of 20,000... No, look, you know what? You know what? I don't think any of their seats are safe. Do you know what? There's a, I just met in the corridor earlier the MP for Mansfield. He's the MP for Mansfield. He's the local council leader. He's got a migrant hotel coming this weekend. He wasn't even consulted. He's in trouble. We'll focus tomorrow on Torquay. A migrant hotel opening in that great English Riviera resort of Torquay. They're all toast. They're all going to lose. I'm convinced of it. They've broken their promise. We voted to take back control. They've let us down. they betrayed us. They deserve, in my view, what's coming to them. There you go. Mark Stein's with me. Over to you. Yeah, you're right about that. And I think uh, when you look where these migrant hotels are, you can knock 10,000 off every sitting MP's vote. Uh, for the towns that have those hotels. And we're actually going to do a, a bit of that with relation to Peterborough. Uh, on the show, we have more on a subject Nigel was talking about, the desecration of war memorials across the kingdom. Uh, we have uh, one of the side effects of this business with the migrants now being supposed fleers from persecution in France is that actually people really suffering from persecution get forgotten. We're going to do some stuff on that too. It's all coming Coming up on The Mark Stein Show right after the break. Hello again, it's Aidan McGiven here from the Met Office. Wet and windy in the far north, especially Shetland and Orkney during the next 24 hours. Showers elsewhere and it will be a little colder, particularly overnight we'll notice that difference. Now at the moment an area of low pressure is close to Scotland as well as to the northwest of the UK. They're maintaining an unsettled look. And as those low pressure systems move into an area of high pressure over Scandinavia, the ice bars tighten. And as a result, the winds have been strengthening across the Northern Isles, and we're expecting gales or severe gales here through the next few days, peaking later Wednesday. Heavy rain here as well. Otherwise, it's showers and blustery showers at that across much of the rest of the UK, especially in the west and the south. But there will be some gaps in between the showers where we see those gaps. Well, the temperatures will dip into the low single figures across northern parts. So a colder start on Wednesday compared with recent mornings, but a bright start for many. There'll be some sunshine around first thing. Further showers in the west and the south during the morning. They tend to fade away, one or two showers elsewhere, but otherwise sunny spells for many. And temperatures will reach 10 to 14 Celsius, not far from average for the time of year. But towards the southwest, well, here we've got the next area of rain and wind moving in. Coastal gales, heavy rain pushing through southwest England into parts of Wales, the Midlands and the southeast by the evening. That rain could cause some issues for Kent and Sussex because of the wet weather we've had recently, so a rain warning in force. And the bands of rain push north, turning showery through the night. All the cloud and the gusty wind, of course, will keep temperatures from falling too low. We're looking at high single figures for most. There will be some clear spells for Northern Ireland and Western Scotland. Some sunshine here first thing once any early fog lifts. And then for the rest of the UK, it's just rain or showers for much of the morning. Generally, the breeze will continue to be strong in the far north of Scotland, as well as for eastern Scotland and northeast England. That's where the wettest weather will be. But eventually it all turns quite showery on Friday and into the start of the weekend. We are GB News, and we'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for bringing us your conversations, for helping our great nation find its voice. We are here for you on radio, television, and online, across England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. It's not the BBC, you know, you actually get your facts right. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 
I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday.